the mountain kingdom of Nepal just can't seem to catch a break. Just a little after two weeks, it was hit by an earthquake measuring 7.4 on the Richter scale that cost over 10,000 people their lives. And today, another earthquake measuring 7.4 on the Richter scale has shaken the country. Good evening. You're watching India Business Hour. I'm Nantara Rai. Shireen's not sitting next to me like she usually does because she's joining the sites in China. She will be joining us a little later in the show tonight. But here are the headlines that we're tracking. The bulls run for cover once again as delays in legislations and weak Asian queues weigh in on sentiment. Sensex snaps a two-day winning streak as it drops over 600 points. The Nifty falls 200 points. The rupee weakens 31 pesos to drop below 64 against the U.S. dollar. The consumer inflation eases to a lower than expected 4.8% in April, reignites hopes of a rate cut in June RBI policy. Hopes get a bigger boost as the industrial output slows to 2.1%. The government is cornered in the Rajya Sabha. The GST amendment bill is sent to a select panel. Experts question whether the tax rollout will meet the April 1st, 2016 deadline. Objections to the land bill of the government eating humble pie in the Lok Sabha. The bill is sent to a joint panel and the report is expected in the monsoon session. Real estate developers in Maharashtra may get an early Ganesh Chaturthi gift. The state government looks to make it easier to get building permits by slashing procedural steps by 60%. That's an exclusive. Our growth forecast in India is a little bit about consensus at this juncture, right? So we need to see how things pan out. And the quality of leadership is excellent between Prime Minister Modi and, and Raghu. Asian Tigers warn of near-term concerns with the India story. Bank of America Merrill Lynch's Ajay Kapoor says he may be overweight in India, but some of his clients are reallocating funds to China. Joanna Chua of City says investors have overexposed themselves to India and are turning wary of non-delivery on the reforms front. They said Chinese investments was not so welcome in India. The Chinese investors send out an SOS to the Indian government saying India feels like a hostile business environment. But former chief economic advisor Arvind Dirmani dismisses these fears saying foreign investors are not used to the Indian way of doing business. India's largest fashion portal Mintra bids goodbye to the World Wide Web says it will go fully mobile by selling only through its app from the 15th of May. Maruti adds another feather to its cap, becomes the first Indian car maker to produce 15 million cars. We'll get to all that news in just a bit, right after we take you through the market action. The reprieve on the Lao Street has been short-lived. Weak global queues, a sell-off in the bond markets, a weakening rupee and angst over delayed legislative action back home has spooked the bulls once again. And key indices gave up all the gains notched up over the last two sessions. The Nifty dropped 200 points and it's ended below 81.50. Under the Sensex now, that plunged more than 600 points to close at 26,877. Sonia Shunai joining us with the market action. Sonia, you know, that two-day rally seems like a dream now, doesn't it? Oh, indeed. You know, the last two days, the rally that we saw is something that we call a sucker's rally. So it flattered to deceive completely. And uh, today we saw a big sell-off in the market. Sensex was down 629 points. Uh, the Nifty gave up on that 81.50 level. So a lot of crucial levels were taken out. And there were a couple of factors for that. One, it's a global risk off in equities that we're seeing. There is a shift to risk-free U.S. bonds uh, that we're noticing. The U.S. bond deals, in fact, rallied all the way up to that 3% mark and that spoke to global investors including uh, investors in India. Not just that, locally as well the sentiment was um, quite sour after the non-passage of GST and the land bill. So over there, things continue to remain quite sticky. And that really led to huge unwinding pressure in the market and in specific pockets like banks and high beta stocks. In fact, the bank Nifty was down 3% today. And not just banks, a lot of uh, blue chip names, you know, the likes of uh, LNT, Reliance, and from the banking pack, ICICI Bank sold off quite a bit. So don't be surprised to see a big sell figure from the FII's tomorrow. In terms of the big losers, uh, 
banks of course uh, uh, topped that list. So Bank of Baroda quickly unwound what it uh, you know gained yesterday. PNB, ICICI Bank and Access Bank. But it was a secular rally. So you had metals, uh, capital goods, cement that were all under pressure. Names like Tata Steel, Vedanta, Hindalco, BHEL, LNT. Ambuja Cement, ACC were all big losers in trade today. On the gaining side, you had stocks few and far between. So just to Dr. Reddy's after reporting a good set of numbers was higher in trade and Hero Motor Corp bucked the trend today. So that stock was higher by about 2 odd percent or so. But mid caps cracked as well and any whiff of bad news in terms of weak earnings was completely trashed. So look at the stocks here. Uh, Phenolix Cables, uh, disappointing earnings under pressure. Yuko Bank, disappointing earnings there. Adani Power, uh, all three stocks uh, reported weak earnings and stocks were down about uh, eight, 7 to 8 odd percent. Then you had names like HDIL, HCC, IDBI Bank, India Bulls Real Estate, all these stocks under pressure. Most experts believe that the worst is not over. It could continue to be a very volatile phase and only if we cross that hump of 85.20 to 85.50, then one can safely say that the uptrend has resumed. Till then, more volatility in stock. Thanks a lot for joining us with that, Sonia. Sonia calling the rally in the last two sessions a sucker rally. Now, it wasn't just the equity markets that were feeling the pain in the currency markets. The rupee also snapped a two-day winning streak. It tumbled over 30 paise and found itself back above the 64 to the dollar. But rupee dealers may have something to look forward to tomorrow, as will the yield-hungry bond markets. Hopes that the RBI will oblige with another rate cut in the June 2nd policy have been reignited, with consumer price inflation falling sharply in April to lower than expected 4.87%. A sharp slowdown in industrial production to 2.1% in March, from nearly 5% in February. Also, as experts hoping the Reserve Bank move may just cut rates to stimulate growth. Lata Venkatesh is standing by to break down those macroeconomic parameters for us. Lata, what did you make of that data? Well, uh, first, the good news really on the uh, consumer inflation front uh, coming in below street expectations uh, at uh, 4.87. Actually, a 4 point something itself is a very good number and uh, that should allay fears of uh, an inflation because of unseasonal rains uh, in the winter months in several parts in North India. So clearly that inflation is out of the way. Uh, and if you look at the ingredients, uh, the chief culprit for the last three and a half years has been food inflation. That has fallen to a very manageable 5.11 versus the 6.14 even in March. And of course, uh, half the rate that we used to get uh, in the same time uh, last year and the year before and the year before. Uh, likewise, whether you looked at vegetables inflation, in fact, uh, uh, vegetable inflation is down to 6.63 compared to 11.26 in the previous month. And the same is true of, uh, you know, meat, eggs, a whole host of things, cereal inflation down to 2%. Uh, uh, yes, there are some signs of uh, inflation returning in fuel for for instance, uh, fuel inflation has come in at 5.6 compared to 5% in the previous month. Uh, likewise, core inflation, which is really services inflation, largely transportation, uh, uh, medical, education, that has ticked up to 4.32 compared to 4.15 in the previous month. Uh, some of these is also international price related because fuel prices uh, have globally been increasing for the last three months. Some of it is creeping in. But net net, uh, uh, the overall inflation, starting with a four number, should be positive. And uh, the expectation is widespread in the market and in the economist's community that uh, chances open up for a rate cut on June 2nd. Uh, the bond markets will definitely uh, uh, move lower. Uh, the yields will move lower, the bond prices will move higher by uh, um, uh, a few basis points tomorrow. As well, uh, you should see some bit of a cheer in the stock markets as well as bond yields move lower. Uh, a, f a further positivity that will, uh, uh, that will be used by the markets to expect a rate cut is the poor IIP number. This is for March, not for April. The March IIP number has come in at 2.1% compared to 4.9% in February and against uh, widespread expectations that it will be closer to 3%. Our own poll was 2.8%. And it's an across-the-board poor performance manufacturing output, which is 80% of uh, the IIP, is coming at a measly 2.2% compared to 5% in the previous month, that is uh, February. And what is most disheartening is electricity coming in at 2%. Electricity did double digits for a better part of 
uh, FY15. Uh, and in fact, for the full year, the growth is actually as good as 8.4%. So February was really bad. March was really bad for electricity. And capital goods is uh, the lone uh, strong performer coming in at 7.6%. Consumer goods didn't follow suit. That contracted by 0.7%. A poor growth number will once again be used by uh, both the government and the industry to prevail upon the Reserve Bank to give that rate cut. Growth needs help and inflation is not a problem, so a rate cut will be called for. But there are chances that the Reserve Bank may not oblige. One, because crude has started rising and you don't know where it will end. And two, uh, the monsoon forecast is very bleak and therefore the good run in food inflation may not be retained, may not be sustained. So there, are, there could be, uh, you know, uh, the argument could go either ways. For tomorrow, however, expect bond and stock markets to cheer these numbers. To what extent RBI would be alarmed by the lagged effect of those preconditions on future inflation is something which we would not know right now and probably that could bias them towards uh, a bit of a wait and watch mode and uh, skip the June uh, rate cut but still probably on balance still go with the rate cut view. If we see food inflation staying extremely low and if we don't see oil prices going up uh, again uh, I guess we can see one more rate cut also after the June, June thing uh, but but that's about it. Don't expect more than 50. 50 is going to be an absolute max. See, I'm looking at 25, and given the fact that this year the rural income is going to remain depressed because of prisons like the aggregate sector not doing well, I don't look out another 25, but maximum uh, uh, this year could be a 50 BP cut from the current levels. But I would go with that the odds are more in favor of a rate cut on June 2nd rather than on a status quo. Experts there with their take on when Raghuram Rajan is going to cut rates. The government has had to finally give in to the opposition's demand of referring the GST constitutional amendment bill to a select panel of the Rajya Sabha. That's after the BJP failed to garner enough support in the upper house. The 21-member select panel will have to submit its report in the next session of parliament. That's the monsoon session. BJP MP Bupendra Yadav is going to head the panel. Other members include Rajiv Chandrasekhar, former aviation minister Prafal Patel, Akali Dal leader Naresh Gujral and Kani Moi of the AIA DMK among others. CNBC TV agent Jutta Panabhiyan caught up with members of the select committee. The verdict was unanimous. The 1st April 2016 deadline can still be met and everyone across party lines supports the GST. The committee will present its report in the next sessions first. Right. So what is the wrong in the... Uh, waiting for uh, one month. Right. Uh, ultimately, it has to get start from 216. So my last question to you is, because the select committee will make some suggestions, those suggestions may not be agreed by the states. Do you think the state FM's no, committee no, will no. also agree with the uh, with you the know, select panel? You know, the select committee's report will be final. If somebody disagree with it, they can put their dissent note and representative from the major political opposition, political parties, they all will have been included. Look, I think it would have been ideal for the GST bill to have been passed in Raj Sabha in this session, and there is no arguing with that. But given that uh, the opposition insisted on a select committee, the government has really no option but to agree to that, number one. Number two, I still think that given the timelines that it is going to be, there is an understanding that it will come up in the next session, we can still make the the overall timelines for introducing GST, which is the next financial year. Yes, sir. sir, you know, the GST constitutional amendment bill was finalized after speaking to states. Now, once the recommendations come in from this panel, do you believe that then again these recommendations will have to be vetted by the state FMs or do you, will you be consulting the state FMs? What is the sense that you have uh, regarding this? I think both. We will also be talking to a few state uh, finance ministers because without that we really have no relevance. Mm -hmm. But once parliament passes it, obviously it will be taken to the state uh, finance ministers council and it will be debated there. So the experts seem to suggest, rather the political experts seem to suggest that the April 1st deadline will remain sacrosanct, but it will all boil down to what the select committee has to say after it studies the bill. CMBC TV 18, Sapna Das breaks down the scenarios that could unfold once that report comes in. Sapna, you know, take us to the various options that you worked out, which is the most feasible option for India to meet that first April 2016 deadline. 
well the most feasible option is basically that there will be no substantive changes that the uh, select panel can suggest and hence uh, uh, the entire process will not have to be reinitiated in terms of uh, you know taking the uh, state fm's nod again and probably the cabinet's nod and trying to table a fresh constitution amendment bill on gst seeking the lower house the lok sabha's nod again and then uh, going over to rajya sabha so that's the ideal situation so the government is keeping its fingers crossed however the point is and the fear is that in case substantive changes are suggested by the panel uh, then it will be a completely different story then the entire process will have to be gone into again this is basically uh, the, the the ministry of finance or the government the center will have to consult the state fms all over again uh, seek the cabinet's nod and uh, try and bring in a fresh bill in the lok sabha seek the lok sabha's nod then go to rajya sabha uh and 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 that's the process that we followed once this is over then the remaining 50% of the state legislatures will have to look at the bill it will come back again for the president's nod and that's how you will have the constitutional amendment bill going through uh, per se so to speak as of now uh, just to reiterate the point if there are no substantive changes made then the government is still trying to meet the april 1 2016 timeline yes it's going to be tough because time will be shorter at its end but in case no substantive changes then this entire process the time and that we require on the new process will be cut short and there are no substantive changes perhaps we should then ask why exactly was the bill sent to the select panel sapna varya still with us and we discussing matters related to taxation goods and services tax may be delayed but something that the government has to cheer about today a 46% hike in the indirect tax collections the just the first month of this fiscal break down these numbers for us and we should caveat this is all based on the old taxation rates well as we are aware about the fact uh, 47 700 odd crores is how the april indirect tax numbers are looking looking like and the major reason for this jump uh, are the excise collections they have shot up by 110% uh, you know from an 8 8600 crore uh, uh, level of uh, april 2015 uh, you are looking at 18000 crores plus for the month of april the reason is one and only which is basically the excise hikes uh, which have been affected from november last year onwards four consecutive uh, hikes uh, had been done by the uh, by the government uh, in terms of the petrol diesel uh, duty hikes and they remain there is the, there is an estimate uh, you know on that front of how much the government plans to garner in the current fiscal so if you if they continue with that this is the trend uh, this should not okay there is a bit of buoyancy in the numbers if you look at the customs number they are also up the growth rate is around 23% you look at uh, look at service tax that's also up 21% so definitely better than better than the previous financial year but the actual jump is coming because of those excise duty hikes which have got factored into better excise collections and uh, for example to give a figure 8 to 10000 crores is the kind of monthly accretion that the government can expect in terms of the excise duty hikes the interesting point will be that once the month of november approaches uh, and in case there are no changes uh, in terms of the excise duty hikes at that point in time we need to really watch out and what happens on the economic front also of course most critical at that point in time we'll have to watch out whether this jump of 46% over 46% will actually sustain or not you can't really say it's a trend as of now the moment we'll have to wait a few more months to see if it's a trend Thanks for Sapna for joining us with both of the story. We told you at the beginning of India Business Hour that Shireen is not here in the New Delhi studio because she's in Beijing. Ni hao ma Shireen. Ni hao Nantara. Uh, and uh, well, you know, it's almost midnight here in Beijing. We've had a long, long day, but it's been a day where we've seen lots of reactions coming in and the latest one is coming in on the Chinese Twitter from the Prime Minister Narendra Modi who said that he's had a wonderful interaction with the Chinese media. He's highlighted the immense scope for further growth in India and China ties, acknowledged that the 21st century will be Asia century. But Nantara, there's also been an important development and through the day today while I've been speaking with experts, uh, both economists as well as policy watchers who are watching India and China, you know, the Pakistan China economic corridor which is a massive 46 billion dollar project that has of course raised headlines and eyebrows in India and when i was asking the chinese uh, that question they said well this is not an effort on the part of china to contain india and this shouldn't be seen by india badly this is in fact a win-win situation and india should perhaps also decide to partner with both countries as far as its economic
corridor is concerned. But I understand from reports at this point in time, and these are, uh, I don't have uh, confirmation, but I understand from reports that India has summoned the Chinese envoy to take up the issue of the Pakistan-China $46 billion economic corridor. I'm just curious as to the timing because Prime Minister Modi will touch down in Beijing uh, uh, tomorrow, actually in Xi'an tomorrow, and start his visit in China. And you're summoning the Chinese envoy for a story that and a development that's a couple of weeks old. So the timing is questionable at this point in time. But Nantara, speaking of the action in China, Devendra Fadnavis, the Chief Minister of Maharashtra, is going to be here accompanying the Prime Minister as well. He's also going to be uh, reaching out to investors here in China. And I understand that you've been tracking a story on some developments in the Mumbai real estate market. Take us through that. That's right, Shireen. And all these changes that we are going to perhaps see is at the insistence of Prime Minister Narendra Modi to, for India to improve its uh, World Bank ranking when it comes to the ease of doing business. What I understand is on the day that you're going to meet the Vendra Pandavis, actually the 15th of May, we're going to see the Municipal Corporation of Mumbai notify a much, much simplified uh, procedure, the norms that have to be followed to obtain building permits. I understand from my sources that nearly 60% of the procedures that need to be followed right now by builders to obtain a permit may actually be uh, weeded out of the system to be dispensed with and that will allow the municipal authority to actually half the time in handing out all of those approvals. All of this based on the fact the World Bank observed it takes 160 days for a builder to get a construction approval in the city of Mumbai and that is why perhaps we're going to see this overhaul in a significant departure from current norms. We're going to see builders and architects being allowed to self-certify while submitting applications with respect to fire permits, forest permits, tree permits, sewage, etc. And also, the municipal corporation is setting itself some strict deadlines, 30 days to give out occupation certificates from the time of applications, 15 days to give out certificates uh, to start the plinth construction from the time of application. And real estate developers already cheering this move. They say 40% of the cost of construction is on account of permits. Well, uh, let's see whether uh, the Maharashtra Chief Minister can actually draw in investment or investors here from China as far as the infrastructure development story is concerned. But Nantara, you know, the markets have been very, very volatile. Today it's been a down day. Our markets have uh, taken a sharp knock once again. But I've been speaking with foreign investors and Ajay Kapoor of Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, is another one of them for our series Asian Tigers. And he believes that we shouldn't be perturbed by these weekly or daily movements for our markets. He believes India is not a weekly story, it's not a monthly story, it's not even a quarterly story. It's a five-year investment bet and he continues to be overweight India. Listen in to Ajay Kapoor of Bank of America, Merrill Lynch. I've been overweight in India since September of 2013 mm -hmm. when my old classmate and friend Raghu took over the central bank. And, uh, you know, I think India has a lot going for it. Uh, one is I think the quality of leadership is excellent between Prime Minister Modi and, and Raghu. Number two, I think India is at a cyclical low. It's uh, seeing trough earnings, uh, it's a trough ROEs, trough EBIT margins. And so you just need to be a little patient for, for these things to begin to move up. Are you surprised by the degree of impatience? I mean, it's been 12 months that this government has been in office. Yeah. And yes, expectations did run ahead of reality and fundamentals. But at this point in time, uh, questions on whether enough has been done, whether they could have, you know, uh, do more as far as reforms are concerned, and whether capital is actually going to go looking for the other hot emerging market. Are you surprised by the degree of impatience? No, I'm not. Uh, we, we guys in finance are pretty impatient people. It's just the way we are. It's just the nature of the beast. Uh, so I, I think you've got to give this government and the central bank governor a lot more time because, uh, as you know, it's a federal structure and uh, it's not easy to get policy making uh, down to the state level. You need uh, the cooperation of, of the states. And uh, I think it's very early days. So, uh, I was reading something in The Economist over the weekend where some guys at Harvard have this thing called the economic complexity score. Right. And what it means is that it, it, they look at your export basket and see how diverse it is. Mm -hmm. And that's apparently a very good predictor of economic growth. I think it's pretty creative. And India comes out number one with a projection of growth for the next few years of about 7 to 8%, which is the highest in the emerging world. So 
I think that India has a lot going for it, uh, and so I am structurally bullish, and I think this recent correction is a pretty good excuse to add more. Hmm. Uh, what would you attribute the recent correction to? Uh, some say that you know money is being taken out to put into markets like China, for instance, or other emerging markets where now people are suddenly overweight, uh, or it could be just a factor of what's happening domestically uh, because of the sort of lack of enthusiasm with what the government has been able to push through as far as policy is concerned. Add to that the vexed issue of uh, taxation related to MAT and FIIs. What would you attribute the current correction? I think it's all of the above. Uh, our clients are very overweight in India and they were quite underweight in China and in fact in China they were overweight the sort of wrong stocks mainly in technology and this has been really a very financials driven rally in China and so they very quickly had to take profits where they had some which was India, India. and then chase China and that's been going on for the last I'd say two months and so now the gap between Indian equities which are which are down about 10 and Chinese equities which are up about 30 yeah. is about 40 percent mm -hmm. and so to me this is a pretty good time to, to actually do the reverse. Which is move money back into India. Yeah. So uh, what is looking good to you at this point in time as far as India is concerned? Which sectors do you believe look vulnerable? Which are the sectors that you believe uh, we could perhaps see significant upside from these levels? Our analysts like the banking sector. Uh, we also like autos. Um, I also like the, not, not the home building sector, mm. but but anything to do with construction and dwellings. Mm. So India is going to add about 200 million people to the workforce by 2030. That's the entire population of Brazil. Yeah. And so these guys are going to need homes to live in. So they'll need air conditioners, they'll need lifts and elevators, they'll need ceiling fans, they'll need furniture. So I think that sector to me looks very attractive. Well, that's Ajay Kapoor of Bank of America Merrill Lynch continues to be bullish on India. Bank of America Merrill Lynch continues to be overweight India. But Nentara, you know, we're here uh, in China, in Beijing, and we've had a summit, the Network 18 India-China Dialogue Summit this morning. And I've been speaking with a bunch of people who track the India and China story very, very closely. And while the Prime Minister is here, along with the other ministers, trying to woo foreign investors to invest in India, but China uh, is not entirely convinced. In fact, uh, some of the people that I spoke to, whether it's Ding uh, Yifa, senior economist at the China State Council, uh, or other experts, believe that as far as Chinese investment into India is concerned, it is seen as being unwelcome. Those are the words that they use. They said that we've spoken with a bunch of Chinese companies, and remember, there's about 100 Chinese companies that have set up operations in India, offices in India, and they felt that uh, their investments into India are unwelcome, and that is because of the complex legacy issues that we have and specifically security concerns to do with companies in the telecom sector Huawei, Xiaomi for instance in fact the Xiaomi example was brought up several times over here in China so we had an interesting uh, uh, one on one uh, or uh, a, t a confrontation of sorts between Arvind Birmani, the former chief economic advisor of the government of India and the former executive director at the IMF and some China watchers on this issue I had some interview with Chinese uh, firms leaders and they met a lot of difficulty in India for investment. They said Chinese investors was not so welcome in India because a lot of Indian businessmen still have some very conservative view about this. They considered Chinese uh, investment in India as kind of threat uh, that could hamper, for example, India's firm's interests, and they would need to protect the domestic market. How much of this legacy baggage that we carry is going to continue to constrain and shackle two-way trade between the two countries? Uh, the FDI GDP ratio of China was much, much higher than India uh, 10 years ago. Again, the gap has been closing. Yeah. More slowly, it is still about one or two percent points higher for China, but again, the trend is very clear. And the reason is, is not just China specific, though security, I'll come to that. Uh, it was this ease of doing business, business right? Yeah. Uh, uh, foreigners, whether they are from the US or China, are not used to the Indian way of doing things, and we are trying to improve it. Uh, Amitabh talked about this Make of India uh, campaign. A big objective is that, to uh, improve the ease of mm. doing business.